Good evening, dear friends, and welcome back to another enchanting chapter of Cozy Sleep Time, Arabian Night Stories. We're thrilled to have you here again, ready to embark on yet another mesmerizing journey into the captivating world of Arabian tales. As the night sky embraces the world in its velvety serenity, and the stars twinkle like a thousand distant dreams. We invite you to take a moment to prepare for a night of profound and rejuvenating sleep. Find your sanctuary of serenity. Let the soft glow of dimmed lights envelop you and snuggle into your coziest corner. In part four of our journey, We've thoughtfully curated stories designed to prepare your mind and body for the deepest slumber. These narratives are akin to whispered lullabies for the soul, guiding you into the realm of dreams with the gentlest touch. But before we submerge ourselves in the captivating tales of Arabian Nights, we invite you to engage in this enchanting experience actively. Express your anticipation with a like, share your thoughts, musings, and favorite bedtime rituals in the comments below, and extend the enchantment by sharing this cozy journey with your cherished friends and loved ones. Your engagement not only supports our channel, it forges a community of dreamers united by the pursuit of peaceful slumber. Now, as we venture into part four, let the entrancing stories of Arabian Nights become a prelude to the deepest and most restorative sleep. Your relaxation is our foremost concern and amidst these soothing tales, your dreams awake, ready to carry you into the night's embrace. Like, comment, share, and let's continue this exquisite journey together fostering tranquility one tale at a time. The Adventures of Prince Kamar al Zaman and Princess Badura Some twenty days' sail from the coast of Persia lies the Isle of the Children of Kaladin. The island is divided into several provinces, each of which are large flourishing towns, and the whole forms an important kingdom. It was governed in former days by a king named Shah Zaman, who, with good rights, considered himself one of the most peaceful, prosperous, and fortunate monarchs on the earth. In fact, he had but one grievance, which was that none of his four wives had given him an heir. This distressed him so greatly that one day he confided his grief to the Grand Vizier, who, being a wise counselor, said, such matters are indeed beyond human aid. Allah alone can grant your desire, and I should advise you, sire, to send large gifts to those holy men who spend their lives in prayer, and to beg for their intercessions. Who knows whether their petitions may not be answered. The king took his vizier's advice, and the result of so many prayers for an heir to the throne was that a son was born to him the following year. Shah Zaman sent noble gifts as thank offerings to all the mosques and religious houses, and great rejoicings were celebrated in honor of the birth of the little prince, who was so beautiful that he was named Kamar al Zaman, or Moon of the Century. Prince Kamar al Zaman was brought up with extreme care by an excellent governor and all the cleverest teachers, and he did such credit to them that when he was grown up, a more charming and accomplished young man was not to be found. Whilst he was still a youth the king, his father, who loved him dearly, had some thoughts of abdicating in his favor. As usual he talked over his plans with his Grand Vizier, who, though he did not approve the idea, would not state all his objections. 
Sire, he replied, the prince is still very young for the cares of state. Your majesty fears his growing idle and careless, and doubtless you are right. But how would it be if you were first to marry? This would attach him to his home, and your majesty might give him a share in your counsels, so that he might gradually learn how to wear a crown, which you can give up to him whenever you find him capable of wearing it. The vizier's advice once more struck the king as being good, and he sent for his son, who lost no time in obeying the summons, and standing respectfully with downcast eyes before the king asked for his commands. I have sent for you, said the king, to say that I wish you to marry. What do you think about it? The prince was so much overcome by these words that he remained silent for some time. At length he said, Sire, I beg you to pardon me if I am unable to reply as you might wish. I certainly did not expect such a proposal as I am still so young, and I confess that the idea of marrying is very distasteful to me. Possibly I may not always be in this mind, but I certainly feel that it will require some time to induce me to take the step which your majesty desires. This answer greatly distressed the king, who was sincerely grieved by his objection to marriage. However, he would not have recourse to extreme measures, so he said, I do not wish to force you. I will give you time to reflect, but remember that such a step is necessary for a prince such as you who will someday be called to rule over a great kingdom. From this time Prince Kamaralzaman was admitted to the royal council, and the king showed him every mark of favor. At the end of a year the king took his son aside, and said, Well, my son, have you changed your mind on the subject of marriage, or do you still refuse to obey my wish? The prince was less surprised but no less firm than on the former occasion, and begged his father not to press the subject, adding that it was quite useless to urge him any longer. This answer much distressed the king, who again confided his trouble to his vizier. I have followed your advice, he said, but Kamaralzaman declines to marry, and is more obstinate than ever. Sire, replied the vizier, much is gained by patience, and your majesty might regret any violence. Why not wait another year and then inform the prince in the midst of the assembled council that the good of the state demands his marriage? He cannot possibly refuse again before so distinguished an assemblage, and in our immediate presence. The Sultan ardently desired to see his son married at once, but he yielded to the vizier's arguments and decided to wait. He then visited the prince's mother, and after telling her of his disappointment and of the further respite he had given his son, he added, I know that Kamaralzaman confides more in you than he does in me. Pray speak very seriously to him on this subject and make him realize that he will most seriously displease me if he remains obstinate, and that he will certainly regret the measures I shall be obliged to take to enforce my will. So the first time the Sultana Fatima saw her son she told him she had heard of his refusal to marry, adding how distressed she felt that he should have vexed his father so much. She asked what reasons he could have for his objections to obey. Madam, replied the prince, I make no doubt that there are as many good, virtuous, sweet, and amiable women as there are others very much the reverse. Would that all were like you? But what revolts me is the idea of marrying a woman without knowing anything at all about her. My father will ask the hand of the daughter of some neighboring sovereign, who will give his consent to our union. 
Be she fair or frightful, clever or stupid, good or bad, I must marry her, and am left no choice in the matter. How am I to know that she will not be proud, passionate, contentious, and recklessly extravagant, or that her disposition will in any way suit mine? But, my son, urged Fatima, you surely do not wish to be the last of a race which has reigned so long and so gloriously over this kingdom. Madam, said the prince, I have no wish to survive the king, my father, but should I do so I will try to reign in such a manner as may be considered worthy of my predecessors. These and similar conversations proved to the Sultan how useless it was to argue with his son, and the year elapsed without bringing any change in the prince's ideas. At length a day came when the Sultan summoned him before the council, and there informed him that not only his own wishes but the good of the empire demanded his marriage, and desired him to give his answer before the assembled ministers. At this Kamaralzaman grew so angry and spoke with so much heat that the king, naturally irritated at being opposed by his son in full council, ordered the prince to be arrested and locked up in an old tower, where he had nothing but a very little furniture, a few books, and a single slave to wait on him. Kamaralzaman, pleased to be free to enjoy his books, showed himself very indifferent to his sentence. When night came he washed himself, performed his devotions, and, having read some pages of the Quran, lay down on a couch, without putting out the light near him, and was soon asleep. Now there was a deep well in the tower in which Prince Kamaral Zaman was imprisoned, and this well was a favorite resort of the fairy Maimun, daughter of Damriat, chief of a legion of genii. Towards midnight Maimun floated lightly up from the well, intending, according to her usual habit, to roam about the upper world as curiosity or accident might prompt. The light in the prince's room surprised her, and without disturbing the slave, who slept across the threshold, she entered the room, and approaching the bed was still more astonished to find it occupied. The prince lay with his face half hidden by the coverlet. Maimun lifted it a little and beheld the most beautiful youth she had ever seen. What a marvel of beauty he must be when his eyes are open, she thought. What can he have done to deserve to be treated like this? She could not weary gazing at Kamaral Zaman, but at length, having softly kissed his brow and each cheek, she replaced the coverlet and resumed her flight through the air. As she entered the middle region she heard the sound of great wings coming towards her, and shortly met one of the race of bad genii. This genie, whose name was Danhash, recognized Maimun with terror, for he knew the supremacy which her goodness gave her over him. He would gladly have avoided her altogether, but they were so near that he must either be prepared to fight or yield to her, so he at once addressed her in a conciliatory tone. Good Maimun, swear to me by Allah to do me no harm and on my side I will promise not to injure you. Accursed genie, replied Maimun, what harm can you do me? But I will grant your power and give the promise you ask. And now tell me what you have seen and done tonight. Fair lady, said Danhash, you meet me at the right moment to hear something really interesting. I must tell you that I come from the furthest end of China, which is one of the largest and most powerful kingdoms in the world. The present king has one only daughter, who is so perfectly lovely that neither you, nor I, 
nor any other creature could find adequate terms in which to describe her marvelous charms. You must therefore picture to yourself the most perfect features, joined to a brilliant and delicate complexion, and an enchanting expression, and even then imagination will fall short of the reality. The king, her father, has carefully shielded this treasure from the vulgar gaze, and has taken every precaution to keep her from the sight of everyone except the happy mortal he may choose to be her husband. But in order to give her variety in her confinement he has built her seven palaces such as have never been seen before. The first palace is entirely composed of rock crystal, the second of bronze, the third of fine steel, the fourth of another and more precious species O. F bronze, the fifth of touchstone, the sixth of silver, and the seventh of solid gold. They are all most sumptuously furnished, whilst the gardens surrounding them are laid out with exquisite taste. In fact, neither trouble nor cost has been spared to make this retreat agreeable to the princess. The report of her wonderful beauty has spread far and wide, and many powerful kings have sent embassies to ask her hand in marriage. The king has always received these embassies graciously, but says that he will never oblige the princess to marry against her will, and as she regularly declines each fresh proposal, the envoys have had to leave as disappointed in the result of their missions as they were gratified by their magnificent receptions. Sire, said the princess to her father, you wish me to marry, and I know you desire to please me, for which I am very grateful. But, indeed, I have no inclination to change my state, for where could I find so happy a life amidst so many beautiful and delightful surroundings? I feel that I could never be as happy with any husband as I am here, and I beg you not to press one on me. At last an embassy came from a king so rich and powerful that the king of China felt constrained to urge this suit on his daughter. He told her how important such an alliance would be, and pressed her to consent. In fact, he pressed her so persistingly that the princess at length lost her temper and quite forgot the respect due to her father. Sire, cried she angrily, do not speak further of this or any other marriage or I will plunge this dagger in my breast and so escape from all these importunities. The King of China was extremely indignant with his daughter and replied, You have lost your senses and you must be treated accordingly. So he had her shut in one set of rooms in one of her palaces, and only allowed her ten old women, of whom her nurse was the head, to wait on her and keep her company. He next sent letters to all the kings who had sued for the princess's hand, begging they would think of her no longer, as she was quite insane, and he desired his various envoys to make it known that anyone who could cure her should have her to wife. Fair May Moon, continued Danhash, this is the present state of affairs. I never pass a day without going to gaze on this incomparable beauty and I am sure that if you would only accompany me you would think the sight well worth the trouble, and own that you never saw such loveliness before. The fairy only answered with a peal of laughter, and when at length she had control of her voice she cried, Oh, come, you are making game of me. I thought you had something really interesting to tell me instead of raving about some unknown damsel. What would you say if you could see the prince I have just been looking at and whose beauty is really transcendent? That is something worth talking about. You would certainly quite lose your head. Charming May Moon, asked Danhash, may I inquire who and what is the prince of whom you speak? 
No, replied Maimoon, that he is in much the same case as your princess. The king, his father, wanted to force him to marry, and on the prince's refusal to obey he has been imprisoned in an old tower where I have just seen him. I don't like to contradict a lady, said Danhash, but you must really permit me to doubt any mortal being as beautiful as my princess. Hold your tongue, cried Maimoon. I repeat that is impossible. Well, I don't wish to seem obstinate, replied Danhash. The best plan to test the truth of what I say will be for you to let me take you to see the princess for yourself. There is no need for that, retorted Maimoon. We can satisfy ourselves in another way. Bring your princess here and lay her down beside my prince. We can then compare them at leisure and decide which is in the right. Danhash readily consented, and after having the tower where the prince was confined pointed out to him, and making a wager with Maimun as to the result of the comparison, he flew off to China to fetch the princess. In an incredibly short time Danhash returned, bearing the sleeping princess. Maimun led him to the prince's room, and the rival beauty was placed beside him. When the prince and princess lay thus side by side, an animated dispute as to their respective charms arose between the fairy and the genie. Danhash began by saying, Now you see that my princess is more beautiful than your prince. Can you doubt any longer? Doubt? Of course I do, exclaimed Maimun. Why, you must be blind not to see how much my prince excels your princess. I do not deny that your princess is very handsome, but only look and you must own that I am in the right. There is no need for me to look longer, said Danhash. My first impression will remain the same. But of course, charming Maimun, I am ready to yield to you if you insist on it. By no means, replied Maimun. I have no idea of being under any obligation to an accursed genie like you. I refer the matter to an umpire, and shall expect you to submit to his verdict. Danhash readily agreed and on Maimun striking the floor with her foot it opened, and a hideous, humpbacked, lame, squinting genie, with six horns on his head, hands like claws, emerged. As soon as he beheld Maimun he threw himself at her feet and asked her commands. Rise, Kashkash, Kash, said she. I summoned you to judge between me and Danhash. Glance at that couch, and say without any partiality whether you think the youth or the maiden lying there the more beautiful. Kashkash Kash looked at the prince and princess with every token of surprise and admiration. At length, having gazed long without being able to come to a decision, he said, Madam, I must confess that I should deceive you were I to declare one to be handsomer than the other. There seems to me only one way in which to decide the matter, and that is to wake one after the other and judge which of them expresses the greater admiration for the other. This advice pleased Maimun and Danhash, and the fairy at once transformed herself into the shape of a gnat and settling on Kamaral Zaman's throat stung him so sharply that he awoke. As he did so his eyes fell on the princess of China. Surprised at finding a lady so near him, he raised himself on one arm to look at her. The youth and beauty of the princess at once awoke a feeling to which his heart had as yet been a stranger, and he could not restrain his delight. What loveliness! What charms! 
Oh, my heart, my soul, he exclaimed, as he kissed her forehead, her eyes and mouth in a way which would certainly have roused her had not the genie's enchantments kept her asleep. How, fair lady, he cried, you do not wake at the signs of Kamar al Zaman's love. Be you who you may, he is not unworthy of you. It then suddenly occurred to him, that perhaps this was the bride his father had destined for him and that the king had probably had her placed in this room in order to see how far Kamar al Zaman's aversion to marriage would withstand her charms. At all events, he thought, I will take this ring as a remembrance of her. So saying he drew off a fine ring which the princess wore on her finger, and replaced it by one of his own after which he lay down again and was soon fast asleep. Then Danhash, in his turn, took the form of a gnat and bit the princess on her lip. She started up, and was not a little amazed at seeing a young man beside her. From surprise she soon passed to admiration, and then to delight on perceiving how handsome and fascinating he was. Why, cried she, was it you my father wished me to marry? How unlucky that I did not know sooner. I should not have made him so angry. But wake up. Wake up. For I know I shall love you with all my heart. So saying she shook Kamar al Zaman so violently that nothing but the spells of Maymoon could have prevented his waking. Oh, cried the princess, why are you so drowsy? So saying she took his hand and noticed her own ring on his finger, which made her wonder still more. But as he still remained in a profound slumber she pressed a kiss on his cheek and soon fell fast asleep too. Then Maimun turning to the genie said, Well, are you satisfied that my prince surpasses your princess? Another time pray believe me when I assert anything. Then turning to Kashkash, my thanks to you. And now do you and Dan Hash bear the princess back to her own home. The two genii hastened to obey, and Maimun returned to her well. On waking next morning the first thing Prince Kamar al Zaman did was to look round for the lovely lady he had seen at night, and the next to question the slave who waited on him about her. But the slave persisted so strongly that he knew nothing of any lady, and still less of how she got into the tower, that the prince lost all patience, and after giving him a good beating tied a rope round him and ducked him in the well till the unfortunate man cried out that he would tell everything. Then the prince drew him up all dripping wet, but the slave begged leave to change his clothes first, and as soon as the prince consented hurried off just as he was to the palace. Here he found the king talking to the grand vizier of all the anxiety his son had caused him. The slave was admitted at once and cried, Alas, sire! I bring sad news to your majesty. There can be no doubt that the prince has completely lost his senses. He declares that he saw a lady sleeping on his couch last night, and the state you see me in proves how violent contradiction makes him. He then gave a minute account of all the prince had said and done. The king, much moved, begged the vizier to examine into this new misfortune, and the latter at once went to the tower, where he found the prince quietly reading a book. After the first exchange of greetings the vizier said, I feel really very angry with your slave for alarming his majesty by the news he brought. Tee him. What news? asked the prince. Ah, 
replied the vizier, something absurd, I feel sure, seeing how I find you. Most likely, said the prince, but now that you are here I am glad of the opportunity to ask you where is the lady who slept in this room last night. The Grand Vizier felt beside himself at this question. Prince, he exclaimed, how would it be possible for any man, much less a woman, to enter this room at night without walking over your slave on the threshold? Pray consider the matter, and you will realize that you have been deeply impressed by some dream. But the prince angrily insisted on knowing who and where the lady was, and was not to be persuaded by all the vizier's protestations to the contrary that the plot had not been one of his making. At last, losing patience, he seized the vizier by the beard and loaded him with blows. Stop, prince, cried the unhappy vizier, stay and hear what I have to say. The prince, whose arm was getting tired, paused. I confess, prince, said the vizier, that there is some foundation for what you say. But you know well that a minister has to carry out his master's orders. Allow me to go and to take to the king any message you may choose to send. Very well, said the prince. Then go and tell him that I consent to marry the lady whom he sent or brought here last night. Be quick and bring me back his answer. The vizier bowed to the ground and hastened to leave the room and tower. Well, asked the king as soon as he appeared, and how did you find my son? Alas, sire, was the reply, the slave's report is only too true. He then gave an exact account of his interview with Kamar al Zaman and of the prince's fury when told that it was not possible for any lady to have entered his room, and of the treatment he himself had received. The king, much distressed, determined to clear up the matter himself, and, ordering the vizier to follow him, set out to visit his son. The prince received his father with profound respect, and the king, making him sit beside him, asked him several questions, to which Kamar al Zaman replied with much good sense. At last the king said, My son, pray tell me about the lady who, it is said, was in your room last night. Sire, replied the prince, Pray do not increase my distress in this matter, but rather make me happy by giving her to me in marriage. However much I may have objected to matrimony formally, the sight of this lovely girl has overcome all my prejudices, and I will gratefully receive her from your hands. The king was almost speechless on hearing his son but after a time assured him most solemnly that he knew nothing whatever about the lady in question, and had not connived at her appearance. He then desired the prince to relate the whole story to him. Kamar al Zaman did so at great length, showed the ring, and implored his father to help to find the bride he so ardently desired. After all you tell me, Remark the king, I can no longer doubt your word, but how and whence the lady came, or why she should have stayed so short a time I cannot imagine. The whole affair is indeed mysterious. Come, my dear son, let us wait together for happier days. So saying the king took Kamar al Zaman by the hand and led him back to the palace, where the prince took to his bed and gave himself up to despair, and the king shutting himself up with his son entirely neglected the affairs of state. The prime minister, who was the only person admitted, felt it his duty at last to tell the king how much the court and all the people complained of his seclusion, and how bad it was for the nation. 
He urged the Sultan to remove with the Prince to a lovely little island close by, whence he could easily attend public audiences, and where the charming scenery and fine air would do the invalid so much good as to enable him to bear his father's occasional absence. The king approved the plan, and as soon as the castle on the island could be prepared for their reception he and the prince arrived there, Shah Zaman never leaving his son except for the prescribed public audiences twice a week. Whilst all this was happening in the capital of Shah Zaman, the two genii had carefully borne the Princess of China back to her own palace and replaced her in bed. On waking next morning she first turned from one side to another and then, finding herself alone, called loudly for her women. Tell me, she cried, where is the young man I love so dearly? and who slept near me last night. Princess, exclaimed the nurse, we cannot tell what you allude to without more explanation. Why, continued the princess, the most charming and beautiful young man lay sleeping beside me last night. I did my utmost to wake him, but in vain. Your Royal Highness wishes to make game of us, said the nurse. Is it your pleasure to rise? I am quite in earnest, persisted the princess, and I want to know where he is. But, princess, expostulated the nurse, we left you quite alone last night, and we have seen no one enter your room since then. At this the princess lost all patience, and taking the nurse by her hair she boxed her ears soundly, crying out, You shall tell me, you old witch, or I'll kill you. The nurse had no little trouble in escaping, and hurried off to the queen, to whom she related the whole story with tears in her eyes. You see, madam, she concluded, that the princess must be out of her mind. If only you will come and see her, you will be able to judge for yourself. The queen hurried to her daughter's apartments, and after tenderly embracing her, asked her why she had treated her nurse so badly. Madam, said the princess, I perceive that your majesty wishes to make game of me but I can assure you that I will never marry anyone except the charming young man whom I saw last night. You must know where he is, so pray send for him. The queen was much surprised by these words, but when she declared that she knew nothing whatever of the matter the princess lost all respect, and answered that if she were not allowed to marry as she wished she should kill herself, and it was in vain that the queen tried to pacify her and bring her to reason. The king himself came to hear the rights of the matter, but the princess only persisted in her story, and as a proof showed the ring on her finger. The king hardly knew what to make of it all, but ended by thinking that his daughter was more crazy than ever, and without further argument he had her placed in still closer confinement with only her nurse to wait on her and a powerful guard to keep the door. Then he assembled his council, and having told them the sad state of things, added, If any of you can succeed in curing the princess, I will give her to him in marriage, and he shall be my heir. An elderly emir present, fired with the desire to possess a young and lovely wife and to rule over a great kingdom, offered to try the magic arts with which he was acquainted. You are welcome to try, said the king, but I make one condition, which is, that should you fail you will lose your life. The emir accepted the condition, and the king led him to the princess, who, veiling her face, remarked, I am surprised, sire that you should bring an unknown man into my presence. You need not be shocked, said the king, this is one of my emirs who asks your hand in marriage. 
Sire, replied the princess, this is not the one you gave me before and whose ring I wear. Permit me to say that I can accept no other. The Emir, who had expected to hear the princess talk nonsense, finding how calm and reasonable she was, assured the king that he could not venture to undertake a cure, but placed his head at his majesty's disposal, on which the justly irritated monarch promptly had it cut off. This was the first of many suitors for the princess whose inability to cure her cost them their lives. Now it happened that after things had been going on in this way for some time the nurse's son Marzavan returned from his travels. He had been in many countries and learnt many things, including astrology. Needless to say that one of the first things his mother told him was the sad condition of the princess, his foster sister. Marzavan asked if she could not manage to let him see the princess without the king's knowledge. After some consideration his mother consented, and even persuaded the eunuch on guard to make no objection to Marzavan's entering the royal apartment. The princess was delighted to see her foster brother again, and after some conversation she confided to him all her history and the cause of her imprisonment. Marzavan listened with downcast eyes and the utmost attention. When she had finished speaking he said, If what you tell me, princess, is indeed the case, I do not despair of finding comfort for you. Take patience yet a little longer. I will set out at once to explore other countries, and when you hear of my return be sure that he for whom you sigh is not far off." So saying, he took his leave and started next morning on his travels. Marzavan journeyed from city to city and from one island and province to another, and wherever he went he heard people talk of the strange story of the Princess Badura as the Princess of China was named. After four months he reached a large populous seaport town named Torf, and here he heard no more of the Princess Badura but a great deal of Prince Kamaral Zaman, who was reported ill, and whose story sounded very similar to that of the Princess Badura. Marzavan was rejoiced, and set out at once for Prince Kamaral Zaman's residence. The ship on which he embarked had a prosperous voyage till she got within sight of the capital of King Shazaman, but when just about to enter the harbour she suddenly struck on a rock, and foundered within sight of the palace where the prince was living with his father and the Grand Vizier. Marzavan, who swam well, threw himself into the sea and managed to land CL. O's to the palace where he was kindly received, and after having a change of clothing given him was brought before the Grand Vizier. The Vizier was at once attracted by the young man's superior air and intelligent conversation, and perceiving that he had gained much experience in the course of his travels, he said, Ah, how I wish you had learnt some secret which might enable you to cure a malady which has plunged this court into affliction for some time past. Marzavan replied that if he knew what the illness was he might possibly be able to suggest a remedy, on which the vizier related to him the whole history of Prince Kamaral Zaman. On hearing this Marzavan rejoiced inwardly, for he felt sure that he had at last discovered the object of the Princess Badura's infatuation. However, he said nothing, but begged to be allowed to see the prince. On entering the royal apartment the first thing which struck him was the prince himself, who lay stretched out on his bed with his eyes closed. The king sat near him, but, Without paying any regard to his presence, Marzavan exclaimed, Heavens! What a striking likeness! And, indeed, 
There was a good deal of resemblance between the features of Kamar al-Zaman and those of the Princess of China. These words caused the prince to open his eyes with languid curiosity, and Marzavan seized this moment to pay him his compliments, contriving at the same time to express the condition of the Princess of China in terms unintelligible, indeed, to the Sultan and his vizier, but which left the prince in no doubt that his visitor could give him some welcome information. The prince begged his father to allow him the favor of a private interview with Marzavan, and the king was only too pleased to find his son taking an interest in anyone or anything. As soon as they were left alone Marzavan told the prince the story of the princess Badura and her sufferings, adding, I am convinced that you alone can cure her, but before starting on so long a journey you must be well and strong so do your best to recover as quickly as may be. These words produced a great effect on the prince, who was so much cheered by the hopes held out that he declared he felt able to get up and be dressed. The king was overjoyed at the result of Marzavan's interview, and ordered public rejoicings in honor of the prince's recovery. Before long the prince was quite restored to his original state of health, and as soon as he felt himself really strong he took Marzavan aside and said, Now is the time to perform your promise. I am so impatient to see my beloved princess once more that I am sure I shall fall ill again if we do not start soon. The one obstacle is my father's tender care of me, for, as you may have noticed, he cannot bear me out of his sight. Prince, replied Marzavan, I have already thought over the matter, and this is what seems to me the best plan. You have not been out of doors since my arrival. Ask the king's permission to go with me for two or three days hunting, and when he has given leave order two good horses to be held ready for each of us. Leave all the rest to me. Next day the prince seized a favorable opportunity for making his request, and the king gladly granted it on condition that only one night should be spent out for fear of too great fatigue after such a long illness. Next morning Prince Kamar al-Zaman and Marzavan were off betimes, attended by two grooms leading the two extra horses. They hunted a little by the way, but took care to get as far from the towns as possible. At nightfall they reached an inn, where they supped and slept till midnight. Then Marzavan awoke and roused the prince without disturbing anyone else. He begged the prince to give him the coat he had been wearing and to put on another which they had brought with them. They mounted their second horses, and Marzavan led one of the groom's horses by the bridle. By daybreak our travelers found themselves where four crossroads met in the middle of the forest. Here Marzavan begged the prince to wait for him and leading the groom's horse into a dense part of the wood he cut its throat, dipped the prince's coat in its blood, and having rejoined the prince threw the coat on the ground where the roads parted. In answer to Kamar al-Zaman's inquiries as to the reason for this, Marzavan replied that the only chance they had of continuing their journey was to divert attention by creating the idea of the prince's death. Your father will doubtless be plunged in the deepest grief, he went on, but his joy at your return will be all the greater. The prince and his companion now continued their journey by land and sea, and as they had brought plenty of money to defray their expenses they met with no needless delays. At length they reached the capital of China, where they spent three days in a suitable lodging to recover from their fatigues. During this time Marzavan had an astrologer's dress prepared for the prince. They then went to the baths, 
after which the prince put on the astrologer's robe and was conducted within sight of the king's palace by Marzavan, who left him there and went to consult his mother, the princess's nurse. Meantime the prince, according to Marzavan's instructions, advanced close to the palace gates and there proclaimed aloud, I am an astrologer and I come to restore health to the Princess Badura, daughter of the high and mighty King of China, on the conditions laid down by His Majesty of marrying her should I succeed, or of losing my life if I fail. It was some little time since anyone had presented himself to run the terrible risk involved in attempting to cure the princess, and a crowd soon gathered round the prince. On perceiving his youth, good looks, and distinguished bearing, everyone felt pity for him. What are you thinking of, sir? exclaimed some. Why expose yourself to certain death? Are not the heads you see exposed on the town wall sufficient warning? For mercy's sake give up this mad idea and retire whilst you can. But the prince remained firm, and only repeated his cry with greater assurance, to the horror of the crowd. He is resolved to die, they cried, may heaven have pity on him. Kamar al Zaman now called out for the third time, and at last the Grand Vizier himself came out and fetched him in. The Prime Minister led the Prince to the King, who was much struck by the noble air of this new adventurer, and felt such pity for the fate so evidently in store for him, that he tried to persuade the young man to renounce his project. But Kamar al Zaman politely yet firmly persisted in his intentions, and at length the king desired the eunuch who had the guard of the princess's apartments to conduct the astrologer to her presence. The eunuch led the way through long passages, and Kamar al Zaman followed rapidly, in haste to reach the object of his desires. At last they came to a large hall which was the anteroom to the princess's chamber, and here Kamar al Zaman said to the eunuch, Now you shall choose. Shall I cure the princess in her own presence, or shall I do it from here without seeing her? The eunuch, who had expressed many contemptuous doubts as they came along of the newcomer's powers, was much surprised and said, if you really can cure, it is immaterial when you do it. Your fame will be equally great. Very well, replied the prince. Then, impatient though I am to see the princess, I will effect the cure where I stand, the better to convince you of my power. He accordingly drew out his writing case and wrote as follows adorable princess. The enamoured Kamar al Zaman has never forgotten the moment when, contemplating your sleeping beauty, he gave you his heart. As he was at that time deprived of the happiness of conversing with you, he ventured to give you his ring as a token of his love, and to take yours in exchange, which he now encloses in this letter. Should you deign to return it to him he will be the happiest of mortals, if not, he will cheerfully resign himself to death, seeing he does so for love of you. He awaits your reply in your anteroom. Having finished this note, the prince carefully enclosed the ring in it without letting the eunuch see it, and gave him the letter, saying, Take this to your mistress, my friend, and if on reading it and seeing its contents she is not instantly cured, you may call me an impudent impostor. The eunuch at once passed into the princess's room, and handing her the letter said, Madam, a new astrologer has arrived, who declares that you will be cured as soon as you have read this letter and seen what it contains. The princess took the note and opened it with languid indifference. 
But no sooner did she see her ring them, barely glancing at the writing, she rose hastily and with one bound reached the doorway and pushed back the hangings. Here she and the prince recognized each other, and in a moment they were locked in each other's arms, where they tenderly embraced, wondering how they came to meet at last after so long a separation. The nurse, who had hastened after her charge, drew them back to the inner room, where the princess restored her ring to Kamaralzaman. Take it back, she said, I could not keep it without returning yours to you, and I am resolved to wear that as long as I live. Meantime the eunuch had hastened back to the king. Sire, he cried, all the former doctors and astrologers were mere quacks. This man has cured the princess without even seeing her. He then told all to the king, who, overjoyed, hastened to his daughter's apartments, where, after embracing her, he placed her hand in that of the prince, saying, Happy stranger, I keep my promise, and give you my daughter to wife, be you who you may. But, if I am not much mistaken, your condition is above what you appear to be. The prince thanked the king in the warmest and most respectful terms, and added, as regards my person, your majesty has rightly guessed that I am not an astrologer. It is but a disguise which I assumed in order to merit your illustrious alliance. I am myself a prince, my name is Kamaral Zaman, and my father is Shah Zaman, king of the Isles of the Children of Kaladin. He then told his whole history, including the extraordinary manner of his first seeing and loving the princess Badura. When he had finished the king exclaimed, so remarkable a story must not be lost to posterity. It shall be inscribed in the archives of my kingdom and published everywhere abroad. The wedding took place next day amidst great pomp and rejoicings. Marzavan was not forgotten, but was given a lucrative post at court, with a promise of further advancement. The prince and princess were now entirely happy, and months slipped by unconsciously in the enjoyment of each other's society. One night, however, Prince Kamaral Zaman dreamt that he saw his father lying at the point of death, and saying, Alas! My son whom I loved so tenderly, has deserted me and is now causing my death. The prince woke with such a groan as to startle the princess, who asked what was the matter. Ah, cried the prince, at this very moment my father is perhaps no more, and he told his dream. The princess said but little at the time, but next morning she went to the king, and kissing his hand said, I have a favor to ask of your majesty and I beg you to believe that it is in no way prompted by my husband. It is that you will allow us both to visit my father-in-law King Shah Zaman. Sorry though the king felt at the idea of parting with his daughter, he felt her request to be so reasonable that he could not refuse it, and made but one condition, which was that she should only spend one year at the court of King Shah Zaman, suggesting that in future the young couple should visit their respective parents alternately. The princess brought this good news to her husband, who thanked her tenderly for this fresh proof of her affection. All preparations for the journey were now pressed forwards, and when all was ready the king accompanied the travellers for some days, after which he took an affectionate leave of his daughter and charging the prince to take every care of her, returned to his capital. The prince and princess journeyed on, 
and at the end of a month reached a huge meadow interspersed with clumps of big trees which cast a most pleasant shade. As the heat was great, Kamar al Zaman thought it well to encamp in this cool spot. Accordingly the tents were pitched, and the princess entering hers whilst the prince was giving his further orders, removed her girdle, which she placed beside her, and desiring her women to leave her, lay down and was soon asleep. When the camp was all in order the prince entered the tent and, seeing the princess asleep, he sat down near her without speaking. His eyes fell on the girdle which, he took up, and whilst inspecting the precious stone set in it he noticed a little pouch sewn to the girdle and fastened by a loop. He touched it and felt something hard within. Curious as to what this might be, he opened the pouch and found a carnelian engraved with various figures and strange characters. This carnelian must be something very precious, thought he or my wife would not wear it on her person with so much care. In truth it was a talisman which the Queen of China had given her daughter, telling her it would ensure her happiness as long as she carried it about her. The better to examine the stone the prince stepped to the open doorway of the tent. As he stood there holding it in the open palm of his hand, a bird suddenly swooped down, picked the stone up in its beak and flew away with it. Imagine the prince's dismay at losing a thing by which his wife evidently set such store. The bird having secured its prey flew off some yards and alighted on the ground, holding the talisman at its beak. Prince Kamar al Zaman advanced, hoping the bird would drop it but as soon as he approached the thief fluttered on a little further still. He continued his pursuit till the bird suddenly swallowed the stone and took a longer flight than before. The prince then hoped to kill it with a stone, but the more hotly he pursued the further flew the bird. In this fashion he was led on by hill and dale through the entire day and when night came the tiresome creature roosted on the top of a very high tree where it could rest in safety. The prince in despair at all his useless trouble began to think whether he had better return to the camp. But, thought he, how shall I find my way back? Must I go uphill or down? I should certainly lose my way in the dark even if my strength held out. Overwhelmed by hunger, thirst, fatigue and sleep, he ended by spending the night at the foot of the tree. Next morning Kamar al Zaman woke up before the bird left its perch, and no sooner did it take flight than he followed it again with as little success as the previous day only stopping to eat some herbs and fruit he found by the way. In this fashion he spent ten days, following the bird all day and spending the night at the foot of a tree, whilst it roosted on the topmost bough. On the eleventh day the bird and the prince reached a large town, and as soon as they were close to its walls the bird took a sudden and higher flight and was shortly completely out of sight whilst Kamar al Zaman felt in despair at having to give up all hopes of ever recovering the talisman of the Princess Badura. Much cast down, he entered the town, which was built near the sea and had a fine harbour. He walked about the streets for a long time, not knowing where to go, but at length as he walked near the seashore he found a garden door open and walked in. The gardener, a good old man, who was at work, happened to look up, and, seeing a stranger, whom he recognized by his dress as a Mussulman, he told him to come in at once and to shut the door. Kamar al Zaman did as he was bid, and inquired why this precaution was taken. Because, said the gardener, 
I see that you are a stranger and a Muslim, and this town is almost entirely inhabited by idolaters, who hate and persecute all of our faith. It seems almost a miracle that has led you to this house, and I am indeed glad that you have found a place of safety. Kamar al Zaman warmly thanked the kind old man for offering him shelter, and was about to say more, but the gardener interrupted him with, Leave compliments alone. You are weary and must be hungry. Come in, eat, and rest. So saying he led the prince into his cottage, and after satisfying his hunger begged to learn the cause of his arrival. Kamar al Zaman told him all without disguise, and ended by inquiring the shortest way to his father's capital. For, added he, if I tried to rejoin the princess, how should I find her after eleven days' separation? Perhaps, indeed, she may be no longer alive. At this terrible thought he burst into tears. The gardener informed Kamar al Zaman that they were quite a year's land journey to any Mahomedan country, but that there was a much shorter route by sea to the Ebony Island, from whence the Isles of the Children of Kaladin could be easily reached, and that a ship sailed once a year for the Ebony Island by which he might get so far as his very home. If only you had arrived a few days sooner, he said, you might have embarked at once. As it is you must now wait till next year, but if you care to stay with me I offer you my house, such as it is, with all my heart. Prince Kamar al Zaman thought himself lucky to find some place of refuge, and gladly accepted the gardener's offer. He spent his days working in the garden, and his nights thinking of and sighing for his beloved wife. Let us now see what had become during this time of the Princess Badura. On first waking she was much surprised not to find the prince near her. She called her women and asked if they knew where he was, and whilst they were telling her that they had seen him enter the tent, but had not noticed his leaving it, she took up her belt and perceived that the little pouch was open and the talisman gone. She at once concluded that her husband had taken it and would shortly bring it back. She waited for him till evening rather impatiently, and wondering what could have kept him from her so long. When night came without him she felt in despair and abused the talisman and its maker roundly. In spite of her grief and anxiety however, she did not lose her presence of mind, but decided on a courageous, though very unusual step. Only the princess and her women knew of Kamar al Zaman's disappearance, for the rest of the party were sleeping or resting in their tents. Fearing some treason should the truth be known, she ordered her women not to say a word which would give rise to any suspicion, and proceeded to change her dress for one of her husbands, to whom, as has been already said, she bore a strong likeness. In this disguise she looked so like the prince that when she gave orders next morning to break up the camp and continue the journey no one suspected the change. She made one of her women enter her litter, whilst she herself mounted on horseback and the march began. After a protracted journey by land and sea the princess, still under the name and disguise of Prince Kamar al Zaman, arrived at the capital of the ebony island whose king was named Armanos. No sooner did the king hear that the ship which was just in port had on board the son of his old friend and ally than he hurried to meet the supposed prince, and had him and his retinue brought to the palace, where they were lodged and entertained sumptuously. After three days, finding that his guest, to whom he had taken a great fancy, 
talked of continuing his journey, King Armanos said to him. Prince, I am now an old man, and unfortunately I have no son to whom to leave my kingdom. It has pleased heaven to give me only one daughter, who possesses such great beauty and charm that I coo. LD only give her to a prince as highly born and as accomplished as yourself. Instead, therefore, of returning to your own country, take my daughter and my crown and stay with us. I shall feel that I have a worthy successor, and shall cheerfully retire from the fatigues of government. The king's offer was naturally rather embarrassing to the Princess Badura. She felt that it was equally impossible to confess that she had deceived him, or to refuse the marriage on which he had set his heart, a refusal which might turn all his kindness to hatred and persecution. All things considered, she decided to accept, and after a few moments silence said with a blush, which the king attributed to modesty. Sire, I feel so great an obligation for the good opinion your majesty has expressed for my person and of the honor you do me, that, though I am quite unworthy of it, I dare not refuse. But, sire, I can only accept such an alliance if you give me your promise to assist me with your counsels. The marriage being thus arranged, the ceremony was fixed for the following day, and the princess employed the intervening time in informing the officers of her suite of what had happened, assuring them that the princess Badura had given her full consent to the marriage. She also told her women, and bade them keep her secret well. King Armanos, delighted with the success of his plans, lost no time in assembling his court and council, to whom he presented his successor, and placing his future son-in-law on the throne made everyone do homage and take oaths of allegiance to the new king. At night the whole town was filled with rejoicings, and with much pomp the princess Hyatelnafaus, this was the name of the king's daughter, was conducted to the palace of the princess Badura. Now Badura had thought much of the difficulties of her first interview with King Armano's daughter, and she felt the only thing to do was at once to take her into her confidence. Accordingly, as soon as they were alone she took Hyatelnafaus by the hand and said, Princess, I have a secret to tell you, and must throw myself on your mercy. I am not Prince Kamaralzaman, but a princess like yourself and his wife, and I beg you to listen to my story, then I am sure you will forgive my imposture, in consideration of my sufferings. She then related her whole history, and at its close Hyatelnafaus embraced her warmly, and assured her of her entire sympathy and affection. The two princesses now planned out their future action, and agreed to combine to keep up the deception and to let Badura continue to play a man's part until such time as there might be news of the real Kamaralzaman. Whilst these things were passing in the Ebony Island, Prince Kamaralzaman continued to find shelter in the gardener's cottage in the town of the Idolaters. Early one morning the gardener said to the prince, Today is a public holiday, and the people of the town not only do not work themselves but forbid others to do so. You had better therefore take a good rest whilst I go to see some friends, and as the time is near for the arrival of the ship of which I told you I will make inquiries about it, and try to bespeak a passage for you. He then put on his best clothes and went out, leaving the prince, who strolled into the garden and was soon lost in thoughts of his dear wife and their sad separation. As he walked up and down he was suddenly disturbed in his reverie by the noise two large birds were making in a tree. 
Kamar al Zaman stood still and looked up, and saw that the birds were fighting so savagely with beaks and claws that before long one fell dead to the ground, whilst the conqueror spread his wings and flew away. Almost immediately two other larger birds, who had been watching the duel, flew up and alighted, one at the head and the other at the feet of the dead bird. They stood there some time sadly shaking their heads, and then dug up a grave with their claws in which they buried him. As soon as they had filled in the grave the two flew off, and ere long returned, bringing with them the murderer, whom they held, one by a wing and the other by a leg, with their beaks, screaming and struggling with rage and terror. But they held tight, and having brought him to his victim's grave, they proceeded to kill him, after which they tore open his body, scattered the inside and once more flew away. The prince, who had watched the whole scene with much interest, now drew near the spot where it happened, and glancing at the dead bird he noticed something red lying near which had evidently fallen out of its inside. He picked it up, and what was his surprise when he recognized the Princess Badura's talisman which had been the cause of many misfortunes. It would be impossible to describe his joy. He kissed the talisman repeatedly, wrapped it up, and carefully tied it round his arm. For the first time since his separation from the princess he had a good night, and next morning he was up at daybreak and went cheerfully to ask what work he should do. The gardener told him to cut down an old fruit tree which had quite died away, and Kamar al Zaman took an axe and fell to vigorously. As he was hacking at one of the roots the axe struck on something hard. On pushing away the earth he discovered a large slab of bronze, under which was disclosed a staircase with ten steps. He went down them and found himself in a roomy kind of cave in which stood fifty large bronze jars, each with a cover on it. The prince uncovered one after another, and found them all filled with gold dust. Delighted with his discovery he left the cave, replaced the slab, and having finished cutting down the tree waited for the gardener's return. The gardener had heard the night before that the ship about which he was inquiring would start ere long, but the exact date not being yet known he had been told to return next day for further information. He had gone therefore to inquire, and came back with good news beaming in his face. My son, said he, rejoice and hold yourself ready to start in three days' time. The ship is to set sail, and I have arranged all about your passage with the captain. You could not bring me better news, replied Kamar al Zaman, and in return I have something pleasant to tell you. Follow me and see the good fortune which has befallen you. He then led the gardener to the cave, and having shown him the treasure stored up there, said how happy it made him that heaven should in this way reward his kind host's many virtues and compensate him for the privations of many years. What do you mean? asked the gardener. Do you imagine that I should appropriate this treasure? It is yours, and I have no right whatever to it. For the last eighty years I have dug up the ground here without discovering anything. It is clear that these riches are intended for you, and they are much more needed by a prince like yourself than by an old man like me, who am near my end and require nothing. This treasure comes just at the right time, when you are about to return to your own country, where you will make good use of it. But the prince would not hear of this suggestion, and finally after much discussion they agreed to divide the gold. When this was done the gardener said, My son, 
The great thing now is to arrange how you can best carry off this treasure as secretly as possible for fear of losing it. There are no olives in the Ebony Island, and those imported from here fetch a high price. As you know, I have a good stock of the olives which grew in this garden. Now you must take 50 jars, fill each half full of gold dust and fill them up with the olives. We will then have them taken on board ship when you embark. The prince took this advice and spent the rest of the day filling the 50 jars and fearing lest the precious talisman might slip from his arm and be lost again, he took the precaution of putting it in one of the jars, on which he made a mark so as to be able to recognize it. When night came the jars were all ready, and the prince and his host went to bed. Whether in consequence of his great age, or of the fatigues and excitement of the previous day, I do not know, but the gardener passed a very bad night. He was worse next day, and by the morning of the third day was dangerously ill. At daybreak the ship's captain and some of his sailors knocked at the garden door and asked for the passenger who was to embark. I am he, said Camaral Zarman, who had opened the door. The gardener who took my passage is ill and cannot see you, but please come in and take these jars of olives and my bag, and I will follow as soon as I have taken leave of him. The sailors did as he asked, and the captain before leaving charged Camaral Zarman to lose no time, as the wind was fair, and he wished to set sail at once. As soon as they were gone the prince returned to the cottage to bid farewell to his old friend and to thank him once more for all his kindness. But the old man was at his last gasp and had barely murmured his confession of faith when he expired. Kamaral Zaman was obliged to stay and pay him the last offices so having dug a grave in the garden he wrapped the kind old man up and buried him. He then locked the door, gave up the key to the owner of the garden, and hurried to the key only to hear that the ship had sailed long ago, after waiting three hours for him. It may well be believed that the prince felt in despair at this fresh misfortune, which obliged him to spend another year in a strange and distasteful country. Moreover, he had once more lost the Princess Badura's talisman, which he feared he might never see again. There was nothing left for him but to hire the garden as the old man had done, and to live on in the cottage. As he could not well cultivate the garden by himself, he engaged a lad to help him, and to secure the rest of the treasure he put the remaining gold dust into fifty more jars, filling them up with olives so as to have them ready for transport. Whilst the prince was settling down to this second year of toil and privation, the ship made a rapid voyage and arrived safely at the Ebony Island. As the palace of the new king, or rather of the Princess Badura, overlooked the harbour, she saw the ship entering it and asked what vessel it was coming in so gaily decked with flags, and was told that it was a ship from the island of the idolaters which yearly brought rich merchandise. The princess, ever on the lookout for any chance of news of her beloved husband, went down to the harbour attended by some officers of the court and arrived just as the captain was landing. She sent for him and asked many questions as to his country, voyage, what passengers he had, and what his vessel was laden with. The captain answered all her questions, and said that his passengers consisted entirely of traders who brought rich stuffs from various countries, fine muslins, precious stones, musk, amber, spices, drugs, olives, and many other things. 
As soon as he mentioned olives, the princess, who was very partial to them, exclaimed, I will take all you have on board. Have them unloaded and we will make our bargain at once, and tell the other merchants to let me see all their best wares before showing them to other people. Sire, replied the captain, I have on board fifty very large pots of olives. They belong to a merchant who was left behind, as in spite of waiting for him he delayed so long that I was obliged to set sail without him. Never mind, said the princess, unload them all the same, and we will arrange the price. The captain accordingly sent his boat off to the ship and it soon returned laden with the fifty pots of olives. The princess asked what they might be worth. Sire, replied the captain, the merchant is very poor. Your majesty will not overpay him if you give him a thousand pieces of silver. In order to satisfy him and as he is so poor, said the princess, I will order a thousand pieces of gold to be given you, which you will be sure to remit to him. So saying she gave orders for the payment and returned to the palace, having the jars carried before her. When evening came the princess Badura retired to the inner part of the palace, and going to the apartments of the princess Hyatelmafaus she had the fifty jars of olives brought to her. She opened one to let her friend taste the olives and to taste them herself, but great was her surprise when, on pouring some into a dish, she found them all powdered with gold dust. What an adventure! How extraordinary! She cried. Then she had the other jars opened, and was more and more surprised to find the olives in each jar mixed with gold dust. But when at length her talisman was discovered in one of the jars her emotion was so great that she fainted away. The princess Hyatelnafaus and her women hastened to restore her, and as soon as she recovered consciousness she covered the precious talisman with kisses. Then, dismissing the attendants, she said to her friend, You will have guessed, my dear, that it was the sight of this talisman which has moved me so deeply. This was the cause of my separation from my dear husband, and now, I am convinced, it will be the means of our reunion. As soon as it was light next day the princess Badura sent for the captain, and made further inquiries about the merchant who owned the olive jars she had bought. In reply the captain told her all he knew of the place where the young man lived, and how, after engaging his passage, he came to be left behind. If that is the case, said the princess, you must set sail at once and go back for him. He is a debtor of mine and must be brought here at once, or I will confiscate all your merchandise. I shall now give orders to have all the warehouses where your cargo is placed under the royal seal, and they will only be opened when you have brought me the man I ask for. Go at once and obey my orders. The captain had no choice but to do as he was bid, so hastily provisioning his ship he started that same evening on his return voyage. When, after a rapid passage, he gained sight of the island of idolaters, he judged it better not to enter the harbour, but casting anchor at some distance he embarked at night in a small boat with six active sailors and landed near Camaral Zaman's cottage. The prince was not asleep, and as he lay awake moaning over all the sad events which had separated him from his wife, he thought he heard a knock at the garden door. He went to open it, and was immediately seized by the captain and sailors, who without a word of explanation forcibly bore him off to the boat, which took them back to the ship without loss of time. 
No sooner were they on board than they weighed anchor and set sail. Kamar al Zaman, who had kept silence till then, now asked the captain, whom he had recognized, the reason for this abduction. Are you not a debtor of the king of the Ebony Island? asked the captain. I? Why, I never even heard of him before, and never set foot in his kingdom, was the answer. Well, you must know better than I, said the captain. You will soon see him now, and meantime be content where you are and have patience. The return voyage was as prosperous as the former one, and though it was night when the ship entered the harbour, the captain lost no time in landing with his passenger, whom he conducted to the palace, where he begged an audience with the king. Directly the princess Badura saw the prince she recognized him in spite of his shabby clothes. She longed to throw herself on his neck but restrained herself, feeling it was better for them both that she should play her part a little longer. She therefore desired one of her officers to take care of him and to treat him well. Next she ordered another officer to remove the seals from the warehouse, whilst she presented the captain with a costly diamond, and told him to keep the thousand pieces of gold paid for the olives as she would arrange matters with the merchant himself. She then returned to her private apartments, where she told the princess Hyatelnafaus all that had happened, as well as her plans for the future, and begged her assistance, which her friend readily promised. Next morning she ordered the prince to be taken to the bath and clothed in a manner suitable to an emir or governor of a province. He was then introduced to the council, where his good looks and grandeur drew the attention of all on him. Princess Badura, delighted to see him looking himself once more, turned to the other emirs, saying, My lords, I introduce to you a new colleague, Kamar al Zaman, whom I have known on my travels and who, I can assure you, you will find well deserves your regard and admiration. Kamar al Zaman was much surprised at hearing the king whom he never suspected of being a woman in disguise asserting their acquaintance, for he felt sure he had never seen her before. However, he received all the praises bestowed on him with becoming modest, and prostrating himself, said, Sire, I cannot find words in which to thank your majesty for the great honor conferred on me. I can but assure you that I will do all in my power to prove myself worthy of it. On leaving the council the prince was conducted to a splendid house which had been prepared for him, where he found a full establishment and well-filled stables at his orders. On entering his study his steward presented him with a coffer filled with gold pieces for his current expenses. He felt more and more puzzled by such good fortune, and little guessed that the Princess of China was the cause of it. After a few days Princess Badura promoted Kamar al Zaman to the post of Grand Treasurer an office which he filled with so much integrity and benevolence as to win universal esteem. He would now have thought himself the happiest of men had it not been for that separation which he never ceased to bewail. He had no clue to the mystery of his present position, for the princess, out of compliment to the old king, had taken his name and was generally known as King Armanos the Younger, few people remembered that on her first arrival, she went by another name. At length, the princess felt that the time had come to put an end to her own and the prince's suspense, and having arranged all her plans with the princess Hyatelnafaus, she informed Kamar al Zaman that she wished his advice on some important business, and, to avoid being disturbed, 
desired him to come to the palace that evening. The prince was punctual and was received in the private apartment, when, having ordered her attendants to withdraw, the princess took from a small box the talisman, and, handing it to Kamaral Zaman, said, not long ago an astrologer gave me this talisman. As you are universally well informed, you can perhaps tell me what is its use. Kamaral Zaman took the talisman and, holding it to the light, cried with surprise, Sire, you ask me the use of this talisman. Alas! Hitherto it has been only a source of misfortune to me, being the cause of my separation from the one I love best on earth. The story is so sad and strange that I am sure your majesty will be touched by it if you will permit me to tell it you. I will hear it some other time, replied the princess. Meanwhile I fancy it is not quite unknown to me. Wait here for me. I will return shortly. So saying she retired to another room where she hastily changed her masculine attire for that of a woman, and, after putting on the girdle she wore the day they parted, returned to Kamaral Zaman. The prince recognized her at once, and, embracing her with the utmost tenderness, cried, Ah, how can I thank the king for this delightful surprise? Do not expect ever to see the king again, said the princess, as she wiped the tears of joy from her eyes, in me you see the king. Let us sit down, and I will tell you all about it. She then gave a full account of all her adventures since their parting, and dwelt much on the charms and noble disposition of the princess Hyatelnafaus, to whose friendly assistance she owed so much. When she had done she asked to hear the prince's story, and in this manner they spent most of the night. Next morning the princess resumed her woman's clothes, and as soon as she was ready she desired the chief eunuch to beg King Armanos to come to her apartments. When the king arrived great was his surprise at finding a strange lady in company of the grand treasurer who had no actual right to enter the private apartment. Seating himself he asked for the king. Sire, said the princess, yesterday I was the king, today I am only the princess of China and wife to the real prince Kamaral Zaman, son of King Shah Zaman and I trust that when your majesty shall have heard our story you will not condemn the innocent deception I have been obliged to practice. The king consented to listen, and did so with marked surprise. At the close of her narrative the princess said, Sire, as our religion allows a man to have more than one wife, I would beg your majesty to give your daughter, Princess Hyatelnafaus, in marriage to Prince Kamaral Zaman. I gladly yield to her the precedence and title of Queen in recognition of the debt of gratitude which I owe her. King Armanos heard the princess with surprise and admiration, then, turning to Kamaral Zaman, he said, My son, as your wife, the Princess Badura, whom I have hitherto looked on as my son-in-law, consents to share your hand and affections with my daughter, I have only to ask if this marriage is agreeable to you, and if you will consent to accept the crown which the Princess Badura deserves to wear all her life, but which she prefers to resign for love of you. Sire, replied Kamaral Zaman, I can refuse your majesty nothing. Accordingly, Kamaral Zaman was duly proclaimed king, and as duly married with all pomp to Princess Hyatelnafaus, with whose beauty, talents, and affections he had every reason to be pleased. The two queens lived in true sisterly harmony together, 
And after a time each presented King Camaralzaman with a son, whose births were celebrated throughout the kingdom with the utmost rejoicing. As we gently conclude another enchanting chapter of Cozy Sleep Time, Arabian Night Stories, Part 4. We hope the magical tales of Arabian Nights have transported you closer to the tranquil realm of restful sleep. Now, before you embark on your own journey to dreamland, take a moment to prepare your sanctuary for a night of deep, rejuvenating slumber. Create an ambience that welcomes serenity and relaxation, dimming the lights, and embracing the cozy comforts of your haven. If you've found solace in these captivating tales and wish to support our mission of providing bedtime bliss, please consider engaging with us. A simple like on this video signals your readiness for peaceful dreams. Share your reflections, musings, or your favorite bedtime rituals in the comments below and extend the enchantment by sharing this experience with your cherished friends and loved ones. Your engagement not only fuels our passion for crafting soothing stories but also forms a close-knit community of kindred spirits on a shared journey to a restful night's embrace. As we bid you good night, may your dreams be as tranquil as the Arabian Nights themselves. We eagerly await the next chapter of our shared voyage, where relaxation and bedtime tales continue to unfold. Like, comment, share, and let's journey together toward the rejuvenating sleep you deserve. Until next time.